And what a beautiful venue we have here today, ladies and gentlemen. It's a particular joy for me to be back in Merthyr because uh, almost 30 years ago, this is where I lived and worked. Um, I always tell people I began my career on The Guardian and I moved to The Express. So that's the Neath Guardian and the Merthyr Express. <laughs> Um, so as I say, I loved my time as a reporter here. It's a fantastic town and a fantastic location for an event like today, exploring what the future of Wales could be. Because if, and I'm sure there are some people here from Merthyr today, and they will tell you, this is where modern Wales began. Um, so it's a good place to think about Merthyr's heritage, but an even better place to think about Wales' future. Uh, it's my second time here in, in a week. I spent a very frosty, evening in Prince Charles Hospital Maternity Department uh, last Sunday, saying hello to my one-day-old niece. And there's nothing like looking at a tiny newborn person you're related to to make you think about the kind of world she'll grow up in and the kind of whales she'll grow up in. I think she's already getting her little head around what it is to be a proud Welsh baby. She was supposed to arrive by plan cesarean on the day Wales play Ireland. Uh, but she thoughtfully turned up three weeks early not to disturb her auntie's trip to Dublin. Um, and no doubt when she's old enough, I'll take her on tour. Um, but not just to learn about rugby, to learn about Wales. I've had a sideline in writing and making radio and television programmes about rugby for more than 20 years. And while obviously I love the game in a purely sporting sense, I've also find, found it's a really good way to look at Wales itself. It's a kind of prism through which we can refract Wales. Um, rugby culture has got a lot of the elements uh, of Welshness in microcosm. Mostly good, some bad. Uh, there's the kind of committee culture, there's the ups and downs of the Welsh psyche as we swoop between world beating, joyful optimism and deep cumric despair. Uh, there's the concept of, of success, a small nation always punching above its weight. And then there's a kind of in-your-face, unashamed patriotism that can only be expressed by wearing a giant daffodil on your head. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I was on a Six Nations weekend in, in Scotland, and I had something of an epiphany where rugby's relationship with Welsh identity is concerned. And I think a trip to Edinburgh can often throw feelings on Welsh identity in relief, because the minute you get there, the kind of scale of this, this great European city, um, it kind of gives you their sense of separation. It's such a kind of distinct country. Uh, and you see evidence of that distinctive, distinctiveness everywhere. And London papers, like the Times, the Daily Mail, have Scottish editions. You'll pick up a paper there, and they can be thoroughly different. Uh, at the time I was there, the BBC had just given Wales an extra 9 million. Scotland got 30 million and a new channel. And Tracy Ellman was devoting a third of her show to satirizing Nicola Sturgeon. And if people are making jokes about you, it's always a good sign that they're taking notice of you, I think. Um, and the people, they just seemed so secure about their national identity. There was a contentment and a confidence that was just tangible. Not that Welsh pride, of course, was in short supply on a Murrayfield weekend. When you see that red army marching towards the stadium and it's kind of cavalcade of daffodil heads and leeks and dragon flags. You know, few countries, I think, are represented so visually by their travelling support as Wales. Yet, be it home, it, home or away, match days are often the most fervent expression of nationhood we have. I've said often, if an alien arrived mid-anthem mid on the turf of the Principality Stadium, it would imagine that Wales was the most self-assured nation on the planet. Because rugby makes 80-minute patriots of all of us. Uh, but I think... You know, notwithstanding the last few, few years of great success, we've been through sufficient roller coaster moments across the decades to appreciate the dangers of, a, of attaching our entire sense of Welsh identity to sport. When the team's on the slide, national pride can plummet as well. And if we put as much passion into caring about other aspects of Welsh life, education, health, our media, our arts, how we're governed, our economic development, our relationship within the union, as we do into expressing our identity through rugby, well, what a team we would be. And I think the players would be quite great, grateful for us to, to kind of remove the entire national burden from 15 pairs of shoulders as well. I mean, I'm not saying that sport doesn't have 
a really great role to play in expressing and projecting our distinctive identity to the wider world. We've seen how Wales in 2011 captured the imagination of, of New Zealand and the, the, the world stage with how well they did in the World Cup. We've seen the football team um, being across the planet's media after a wonderful success in the Euros. But sometimes here, closer to home, it feels as if caring about our country's destiny begins and ends with an oval ball on a patch of grass. You think about the anthem, the intensity on the face of Alan Wynne and the faces in the crowd when that second glad bounces off the roof of the closed stadium. If that could be harnessed and channeled into supporting Wales per se as much as Team Wales. You think about the media, the debates on selection and tactics that play out on the back pages, more often on the front pages in Wales, in phone-ins, social media streams, if that could be matched by a similarly passionate national conversation on the future of Wales itself, not just the progress of its rugby team through an eight-week tournament. And if only we got as excited about and then engaged with the politics of Cardiff Bay in Westminster, the impact it has on our day-to-day -day lives as we do about the shenanigans of the WIU. But I think I can identify with a safe form of patriotism, one that is steeped in sport, <coughs> rather than politics, because it's very much part of my own experience. I come from a background that has embraced cultural patriotism, but not political nationalism. Old labor, post-industrial, happy to scream our identity from the rugby stands, or weep with hirife on the sound of a male voice choir singing a vanoi. But as for independence, well, that was the aim I felt with typical Valley's chippiness of those who said people like me weren't as Welsh as people like them. Um, my parents were children of the Second World War, a time when Britishness was not just an identity, but an essential act of togetherness in the face of a terrifying foe. And then there was my nan, who brought up in um, considerable poverty, had 12 children, wife of a minor, worked her fingers to the bone. But nan had a reverence for royalty that ran to a framed picture of the entire extended clan. We're talking second cousins as well on the wall of her tiny terraced house. And even in 1977, I thought that was a bit weird. Um, but these were the kind of cultural conditions that made growing up in some parts of Wales a very unionist experience. And, and we shouldn't judge people for it, least of all me. We're all products of our environment. Yet as Eddie Butler, Eddie Butler of all people, you won't mind me saying this, because I've almost teased him about how posh and mama sure he is. Um, you know, as he articulated so eloquently last year from the balcony of, of Merthyr's Red House, it's different now even for those of us who were raised to think Britain was reasonably great. The United Kingdom that made my parents proud to call themselves British no longer exists, said Eddie, and he's right. So let us pause for a moment to ponder that, that a rousing speech in favour of Welsh independence was made by Eddie Butler. As Captain of Wales, Eddie threw some very smart passes on his day, in his day, but his presence on the Merthyr Yes Cymru platform I thought was a glorious curveball. Because that's what makes me excited about creating a national conversation about independence. Unexpected voices are speaking out. Voices that will reach those who might not usually listen. And I'm here today to listen and learn as much as speak. I've got to be honest, over the years my own feelings about independence have wavered somewhere between ambivalence and scepticism until now. One of the key arguments that's worried me against independence has been the economic arguments, and I know we're going to hear quite a bit more about that today. Uh, the way that it would be a heart rather than a head decision for Wales, because all the romantic patriotism in the world is useless if an independent Cymru would be worse off. But with all the indications pointing to Wales being devastated econ economically by Brexit, who is best placed to look after our interests, us or them? And to go back to the rugby analogies, we have to dictate our game plan, not simply play catch-up rugby. The possible breakaway of Scotland and a growing support for a united Ireland should shock us out of Cymric complacency and get us thinking, what will be left for Wales in the shakedown of a breakup of the Union? We need self-determination by design rather than default. Wales has to start thinking about its own destiny because no one at the other end of the M4 is going to give us stuff. Um, historian Martin Johns, I always think is one of our most kind of thoughtful modern commentators on Welsh life, and he's written, the UK could disintegrate whether Wales is ready or not. It's very unlikely that Wales will be driving the changes, 
but it will have to know how it wants to respond and whether it wants to remain in the union where England is the only other member. The practicalities have to be discussed before time runs out. And I think the right environment has to be created for these discussions to take place. And perhaps here we can take our cue from rugby. Rugby is a game for all shapes and sizes. The national team has often encompassed players with roots that stretch back centuries alongside men who arrived 36 months ago. Or they've got a gran in Carnarvon. But we haven't cared. If they're committed to the Welsh cause, if they take pride in that red jersey, then we support them. And the makeup of Wales itself can be similarly nuanced and intriguing and diverse um, and exciting. It's a, we're a team of three million. We can span everybody from a first language Welsh speaker in Bangor to a second generation Somalian in Butte Town. So a movement that is, in, <coughs> excuse me, a movement that is inclusive and embracing of all strands of Welsh identity is essential. Even those who can't contemplate being part of a nation that decides its own destiny should welcome the opportunity to get engaged in the debate. Any discussion of what can make Wales a better place should be encouraged. So I'd like to thank Yes Cymru in particular for creating a team environment that feels warm and welcoming. I thought I might still be on the bench. Um, I might still be somewhere between kind of indie curious and indie convinced, but I'm willing to pick up the ball and run. Deal come grand off.